Great. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you for having us again, Kit and Stephanie. It's great to great to be with you. I think we missed you guys last year, which was uh, really a shame, but it's good to be here again. And uh, um, again, if you have any questions, uh, try and get them to, to Kit and, um, and Stephanie, and we'll see if we can deal with them. What we want to talk about this afternoon is really the fundamentals of understanding and protecting your company's intellectual property. Uh, in order to do that, let me, uh, here we go. We, we think to understand intellectual property, it's, it's important to know first what types of intellectual property protections are available, be they patents, trade secrets, copyrights, or trademarks. Then to understand uh, the intellectual property protection priorities. Next step we believe in developing a roadmap is to think about where and when we would like to pursue protection. And the, the uh, quintessential question is how does a company best use its resources to maximize its intellectual property protection and minimize IP exposure. So we'll start with some of the fundamentals of patents. Uh, this, we really, we've done this many times and, and, and I just really care a lot about people understanding what patents are. Uh, it, it, so many people we know starting businesses or thinking, starting about, starting, thinking about starting businesses uh, hear things about patents and they really don't know what they are. So at least I wanna make sure that everyone's heard this at least once uh, in your lives and then you can you know, have, have some fundamentals to go with. So first of all, what are patents? Patents are exclusive rights. They're the right for a limited time to exclude or stop others from making, using, or selling the claimed invention. That's called infringement of the patent right. The operative word here is the right to exclude. A patent is not an affirmative right to make, use, or sell the invention. It's an exclusive right to prevent others from doing so. In fact, it's possible to infringe others' patent rights even by practicing your own invention. Uh, the example we typically give is if, if the first caveman developed a stool with uh, comprising a seat having three legs, the second caveman came along and developed a, a chair uh, comprising a, a seat, three legs and a back, the second person might be able to have gotten a patent over the first uh, patent, but they may not be able to practice their invention because their they would still be practicing the elements of the first patentee's claims. So just because one has a patent doesn't mean you can practice it. It gives you the right to stop others from patenting, from practicing what's claimed. Now, in order to get a patent, it also must be novel and not obvious and fully described in the application. Why should you care about patents? Uh, certainly to block competition, that's the exclusionary right. You should care about patents to attract investors. And nowadays, investors are looking for patents. Um, we frankly think they should look more at the quality of the patents, but they do want to make sure that there are patents as part of the, the target's estate. Um, patents can also serve as collateral for financing. They can provide cross-licensing collateral and settlement of patent infringement actions. They, they can provide, provide their own revenue streams it's also a good way to document the company's intellectual property. And they can help establish a prior user defense to infringement claims. So there are various types of patents in the US. Utility patents protect processes, machines, articles of manufacture, compositions of matter, including their functional features. And they're generally enforced for 20 years from the filing date. Now you may have also heard about provisional patents. Well, a provisional patent is just an application. It's not a formal patent application in that it cannot issue as a patent. Provisional applications don't need claims, oaths, declarations, or prior art statements, but they are good uh, in a pinch um, because they can get, get something quickly on file and they provide evidence of a date for the invention disclosed. Where many people go wrong in thinking about provisional patent applications is that, oh, once we filed a provisional, we're all protected. That's not the case. Again, the provisional is only as good as a disclosure 
on the provisional's filing date. Uh, the, the written description requirements in terms of sufficiency of disclosure are the same for utility and design patents. Other types of patents include design patents, which protect new ornamental designs for articles of manufacture, but not their functional features. They're only uh, enforced for 15 years from their issue date. And just to say you've heard of it, there is such a thing as a plant patent, which protects plant varieties that again are not new and not obvious. So what are the requirements to obtain a patent? In the US, patents will be granted on an application if it, the invention falls within the scope of the subject matter Congress determined as deserving of patent protection. Again, processes, machines, articles of manufacture, compositions of matter, but not laws of nature or mental steps. In the US also, a patent will be granted only to the first inventor to file. You have to be a true inventor. You can't derive the invention from someone else and be an inventor. Again, you'll hear us say more and more about this, but the invention has to be useful, novel, and non-obvious. And again, the invention has to be fully described in the manner described by the patent statute. So what can be patented in the US? What's patent eligible? machines like computer systems, articles of manufacture, compositions of matter, or processes, um, perhaps software or computer implemented methods. Now we've got to be careful here. Uh, software per se isn't patentable, but there, there are creative ways that we can, in essence, get patent protection for software by describing it as part of a system or, or as method steps. So I don't know if you've if all had a chance to see a patent before. We've all certain, certainly heard of them, but let me just show an example of what a patent looks like. This is what the cover face of a patent we obtained uh, looks like. You'll see there's certain identifying information on the face of the patent. This little uh, summary of some of the prior art that was considered in the, in the examination of, of the application and an abstract. Then patents typically have drawings. You can see as we flip through these drawings that these are kind of schematic drawings, they're representations. They aren't dimensional drawings, but they do show the interrelationship of elements. You see they have numbered parts and I'll show you where that comes in in just a second. So again, you've got the various elements broken down and numbered and as we'll see, they're described in the patent document itself. So the drawings are again, are to give one skilled in the art the ability to understand the invention and practice it. Not necessarily again, but down to tolerances and dimensions, but still know the configuration. So the patent document also then has this uh, written description. Um, it has some uh, background of the prior art, description of the drawings, then this detailed description of the invention. This is where the invention is described by reference to those reference numerals that we mentioned earlier. You can see, again, the, inner, the elements and their interrelationship is what's described in the, in the patent specification. Now, this is important. This is a very important thing to realize about patents. If you see the end here <clears throat> on the left and the bottom, there's, there are these numbered paragraphs that begin, uh, and there's a little introductory phrase, the invention claimed is. Then what's below there are what's called the claims. This is, this is something that people don't really understand, but it's, I want you to. The claims are what define what is protected by the invention. Again, the claims define what's protected by the patent, just like your deed to real property describes the meets and bounds of the, four, of the corners of your property, your real property. The claims define the meets and bound, bounds of what's protected by the patent, and hence, would you have a right to exclude others from doing? So what's in the description and the drawings is all well and good, but they really just give uh, breadth and life and meaning to the claims. The claims are what's actually patented. So the claims are what have to be fully described, fully enabled, and the claims are what's used to determine who the proper inventors are. The inventors have to be the inventors of what is claimed. So this is what's protected by the by the patent. 
Okay, let's move on to a, little, a brief overview of the patent process. Um, typically what, what patent lawyers like us do are prepare the applications by fully describing the invention. Again, the detailed description, the drawings and the claims. We file that after the inventor approves it uh, with the PTO. The patent office conducts an examination. They search for the prior art that they think is relevant to the claims. They usually issue office actions rejecting the claims. Um, as, as an aside, they're not supposed to take your claims as a roadmap to try and search the prior art uh, in, in, in hindsight, but that's what they do every day. So a lot of our job is to convince the examiner when they do reject the application, why the combination of prior art that the examiner has uh, picked uh, doesn't properly render the patent, the patent either non-novel non or non-obvious. So we can commit, submit an amendment arguing and maybe amending the claims if necessary. Um, the office may then issue a final office action in the, in the process and they may, uh, then we can uh, appeal or amend the case. So that's an overview of the process. Let's shift gears for a second to design patents. As I mentioned, uh, design patents protect ornamental aspects of inventions. Uh, basically what's, what's shown in the drawings is what's covered by the design patent. Not, uh, if you look at the center figure there, not what's in the dotted lines, but what's in the solid lines of uh, obviously the iPhone or the iPad on the right there. Those are design patents. So in the US, as I've said, we're gonna be talking about novelty and non-obviousness a lot. Um, novelty means that the claimed invention was not described identically in a printed publication or in public use on sale or available to the public, public before the filing date of the claimed invention, okay? Or um, the if the claimed invention was described in a patent or published application, naming a different inventor, and filed before the effective filing date, your invention would not be novel. And novel, again, is an identity uh, correlation. Uh, it has to be, the, the four corners of your claims have to be disclosed in a single item of prior art for this section to apply in, in your patent to be unpatentably uh, non-novel. Okay, so there's, you, you can imagine here that there's, this is, this is, uh, Often it should be a pretty black and white analysis. Where the grayness comes in is not is non obviousness. You can imagine it's easy to get around, you know, someone's identical prior art, but it's tougher to get around uh, this this obviousness question, because a patent cannot be obtained if the differences between again the claimed invention and the prior art are such that the claimed invention would have been obvious before the filing date of your claims to a person having ordinary skill in the art to which the claimed invention pertains. So that's where the grayness comes in. And there's thousands of cases, frankly, just, uh, going before a judge and or jury determining what's obvious and what isn't. Here are some of the, uh, the things that they look at in determining obviousness. Um, if you combine prior art elements according to known methods to achieve predictable results, that's obvious under the patent law. Simply substituting a known element for another to obtain predictable results would be obvious. Using known techniques to approve similar devices in the same way would be obvious. If something's obvious to try, then it's unpatentably obvious. If there's only a finite number of identified predictable solutions with a reasonable expectation of success and you're using one of them, that would be obvious. And also known work in one's field of endeavor could prompt variations either in the same field or a different one based on design incentives or market forces if the variations would have been predictable to one of ordinary skill in the art. Jordan, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, 
you know, you work, obviously people show up every day um, wanting to know if this is, here's my idea, here's my invention, is it patentable? So how long does it take you? And on just, well, I mean, you or, you know, just IP lawyers that within one hour of conversation, is it a week before you kind of realize, you know, um, do you have to do a lot of research or does sometimes it, it, is it often just, you can have a conversation and realize it's not patentable? It really depends. That's a great question, Kit. It depends on the, the nature of the invention. Um, it always requires a comparison between what, what might be claimed and what the priority is. Now, candidly, sometimes people like Loren or me have a sense of what the priority contains. So we have, we can develop a pretty good gut feel often about something. But in a highly technical subject matter, that's not the case. I mean, you really do need to do searching out, go do searching to find out the chances of getting a patent, which can take you know, days or, or weeks, even depending on how complex the invention is. Okay. Uh, let's talk about some things not to do before filing at least a provisional application, especially if you want protection outside the United States. And I say at least a provisional, our preference is pretty much always, if possible, to file a robust patent disclosure that, contain, that contains uh, maybe multiple inventions that, that could be divided apart later, but we always wanna make sure that this, this is an enabling, uh, clear disclosure um, with all the components. You know, they have to be described in a way that, that one skilled in the art would understand them. We like to be frankly over-inclusive in terms of disclosure and not, not have that ever come into question. Because remember, a patent document uh, needs to be written for a number of different art audiences. It needs to be written for um, the inventor. It needs to be written for the inventor's company, typically. It needs to be written for the patent office so that it's comprehensive and clear. It needs to be written by a judge or a jury who might be called to interpret it. Um, so you, you, know, it's, you can imagine a highly technical subject matter um, it's tough to, to be clear, yet, yet highly technical. So, so, so you've got, our job is to explain often PhD level stuff in a way that a history major judge or a juror who's a baker can understand enough to say, yeah, I think I know what's going on here and I think this person ripped them off. That's, that's kind of how things go. And that's, uh, as you know, CMU, uh, what happened in, in your big case. Um, so going back, some, some things not to do before filing at least a provisional, if not a, a fully, um, fully enabled disclosure. Um, you don't wanna publish your manuscript, paper, thesis before you file something. This is, this is the biggest reason we file provisional applications is because someone wants to publish something the next day. So we'll file a provisional the day before if we have to with whatever we've got. Um, that is not desirable, but it has to happen occasionally from a practical standpoint. You don't want to disclose your invention in a presentation before you file. You don't want to discuss it without a confidentiality agreement. You don't want to offer for sale or conduct commercial activity before filing a provisional or non-provisional application, discussing at a trade show, submitting a non-confidential grant application, or conduct experiments with the invention in a public way. Again, you want to file an application before you do those things. Now, a footnote is that in the US, you've had basically a year between, between these events and you need to file an application. Okay, it's called a grace period. Now, it's important to recognize that a lot of countries don't have that grace period. So that if you, ever, if you do want to file in foreign countries, you need to file at least a priority application before any of these things take place. So you'll antedate those events. When I say priority application, what I mean is there are, there are convention, international conventions between countries whereby the, with, if it's filed within a year, coincidentally it's a year, the, an application uh, in a foreign country can claim the benefit of the, the US filing date. So you can, in essence, 
benefit from the U.S. filing date. So typically what happens is you file a U.S. application on day one, you've got to file an international, you know, a national application in a given foreign country or a patent cooperation treaty application within that year, and you're still entitled to uh, the U.S. filing date. Uh, George, I have a question. I'm, I'm entering a team that uh, has a medical device. Unfortunately, they published a paper um, about their medical device. So uh, did I understand you to say they have a year of grace period or is that just for the international? Just for the US. So, so if, if, if they, let's just say, pick, say that they filed last December, um, you can file in the US with, by this December but the foreign rights may have been lost. Because of their publishing. Yes, is, sir. Is there a, a standard by which, I, I know a lot of patents are um, gone around by subtle tweaks. You're going back to your example of the three-legged stool, you know, my stool has four legs. So, you know, I can claim a difference, you know, in, in design, uh, you know, or, or function. So is there a, standard of which they have to tweak their original uh, disclosure to the point where it might be different enough to be uh, eligible for a patent? Yeah, yeah, it, it, has to be, it has to be novel, which means different. And the four versus three is a difference in your example. And the question is, would, would four versus three be obvious? That, you know, that's, that's highly fact dependent. Um, it, it really depends on the technology, Don. Uh, it's tough to, it's really tough to answer that in the abstract. So, it, okay. you know, things, things like this really require hard looks as to really what was disclosed um, and what, what differences might there be that can be claimed. We always want to keep coming back to the claims. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Sure. So let's talk about real briefly some patent application cost issues. I'll give you some examples and, uh, Loren can talk more about this uh, later on if, um, if she's got time, but just to throw some numbers out there um, for, now again, there are factors related to the entity size, but just for a large entity, uh, application costs uh, for a simple mechanical case might be $8,000 range, uh, all in, include filing fees, drawing fees, and attorney's costs. Um, more, uh, more, more moderate invention might be eleven, twelve thousand dollar range, typically, and you can imagine that a complicated application could be uh, fourteen, fifteen thousand dollars, or even more. Um, there are prosecution costs that, that, depending on the back and forth you have with the examiner, um, and, and you know that that's when it's really kind of out of our hands. The examiners sometimes do a great job, and and really hone in on pertinent prior art. Other times. Uh, they just don't get it and they, and they give you uh, garbage references and you have to spend a lot of time educating them. And sometimes um, that can be difficult. So prosecution costs are a few thousand dollars at each iteration, I would say, a few to several. Uh, and then issuance costs, um, they're not as high. They're you know, low thousands of dollars. So George, I heard, I think I heard somebody say that one way to reduce the cost, uh, obviously time is money in your case, uh, is for them to take a stab at writing those first portions of the patent, which is all sort of the background information of the industry and the nature where your specialty really is needed, is essential as in how to structure the claim. So should people bring their first draft to you? Does that make it easier or better or cheaper? <laughs> yeah, you, you've, heard this, you've heard this spiel before, Kit. That's where we come to that later in the presentation, as you know. Um, but that's a terrific point. And we really can't stress this uh, enough. The more the, the inventors can give the attorneys to work with, um, the better the quality of the product will be. The inventors, they're the creators of the invention. They know the technology, they're the PhDs. And our job is to, again, understand that and interpret it and, and get it in writing and in a legal document, but the inventors really understand it. And to the extent they can pre prepare good descriptions of their invention, good description of the prior art, and help, and we can then iterate with them on the claims, the better the, 
product will be. Again, we really try and have very comprehensive patent applications. So, um, but you know, we do this all the time, folks. And inventors are always busy people, and and they, you know, they have inventions and they want to start a business and make all kind of money. And if if they really put a little more time into disclosing their inventions fully, they will save money in the application process. I promise you. You know, so often we've got, you know, a piece of paper or two to describe it's going to be a 50 page patent application. Um, we can do that. We do it all the time. It costs, it takes us more time. It costs more money. Um, but if the inventors can have just a little more discipline in and just get there and just get their ideas down, it can really streamline things and, and it will be a better product. I guarantee you. Great question. Yeah, how, how do we define uh, prior art? What, what, what does that like explain prior art means? Uh, prior art is what uh, you have to be patentable over. It's, it's what's been done before in essence. So, you know, the, the patent, um, you have to have, you have to be different novel and non-obvious over the prior art. So it, again, it's prior patents, it's prior publications. It, it's stuff that's been on sale before. That's what's in the prior art. And stay tuned. Loren will talk to you about how to search for the prior art in her presentation. So, so some more questions too. So the provisional validity is one year, right? Validity of the provisional patent, provisional, provisional patent. Yeah. So it should be one year. So within that time frame, we have to file the original patent. Yes. So, uh, for example, when we uh, file the provisional patent, we are if we are publishing the paper, if we fail to uh, get the original patent application done in one year, what happens to that? The provisional application poof goes away. It means nothing. You've got to file the non-provisional within that year. Okay. Have to have, have to. That's just the law. Um, Let's keep moving if we could. I don't want to take too much of Loren's time. Talk about the difference between patents and trade secrets. Um, trade secrets are something that really I think is, is not fully understood by a lot of companies. And it's, it, it's something they have that they may not know they have and, and provide value that they don't know that they can realize. So what are trade secrets? They're anything that can be and is kept confidential and it provides a commercial advantage. Example, a method of manufacture that keeps manufacturing costs low, that secret can be a trade secret. Um, whereas patents have limited durations, trade secret rights may be of unlimited duration. Many of you may have heard the, the, the lore out there about the Coca-Cola formula that no, um, it is a secret. People have tried to reverse engineer it, um, but they, no one's been able to. And the, the story goes that no single person uh, has the whole formula or even has access to the whole formula. So it's one of the most valuable trade secrets uh, that's publicly, publicly seen, um, publicly identifiable. And again, if uh, a downside to trade secrets is that someone, um, if, they, if they were able to reverse engineer it, independently develop the technology, the trade secret doesn't protect it. Okay, now independently developed means Again, not deriving it from someone you have an agreement with, but if you if you see something and independently develop it, you can you can do that. So some examples of trade secrets: economic terms, configurations, underlying software, business methods, supplier data, customer data, user data. All are examples of trade secrets. Again, I said you've got to protect them. They have to be protected by contract with employees, contracts with third parties contracts with visitors, perhaps to your facility, and by limiting access. So the key points on trade secrets are you have to know what you have, know who will have it, and you need to lock it up legally and physically. Let's keep moving, move through, I'm gonna move a little bit quicker just for time's sake. Uh, we're gonna move on to copyrights now. So what are, what are copyrightable works? Um, copyrights are provided by statute just like patents are. In fact, they're, they're both stem from the Constitution of the United States. Um, they're very different though. Copyrightable works arise upon creation automatically. They protect original works of authorship that are fixed in a tangible medium of expression. 
nowadays, tangible, of course, includes the electronic medium. Um, so copyrightable works can be books, paintings, music, dramatic works, motion pictures, software again, user inter interfaces, website pages, can all be copyrightable. But it's important to recognize that copyrights do not, don't extend to ideas, procedures, processes, systems, methods of operation, regardless of the form in which it's described. So they don't protect ideas. You can see how the copyright rights compare to patent rights. Patent rights can protect ideas, physical implementation of ideas. Copyrights don't protect ideas. It's just the form of that expression, like making a copy of something. Um, you don't have to register federal copyrights federally until you're going to file a lawsuit. But honestly, because the application costs are fairly modest um, and the application process is also fairly straightforward, it's a good idea to register copyrights in important works. Uh, another important facet of copyright law is that the author owns the copyright. Absent an agreement. Now, who's the author? It's the person who created the work, or if the work is a work for hire, then it's the employer or other person for whom the work was prepared, is the author. Now, just because someone prepares a work for something, someone doesn't automatically make it a work for hire. Certainly if it's done by an employee or it's for his or her employer, then it can be a work for hire. Um, but works that, that you specially commission or order can only be works for hire, again, that, that the author automatically owns if it's in a written document and it's one of, it's one of these nine uh, statutory categories of works. So not just every, every work can be a work for hire by a third party. It has to be a, collect, a contribution to a collective work, part of a motion picture, a translation, supplementary work, compilation, and these other examples here. So it's, it's careful to recognize that something that you think should be a copyright, should be a work for hire because you're paying for it to a contractor, for example, may not be separately a work for hire. So what do you do if someone is an independent contractor? Uh, you should have uh, an agreement with them that it's, it's, it says that this is a work for hire. Um, you should also say that even if it's not a work for hire, you're assigning us the rights. You can, you can get into whether it fits into one of those nine statutory categories later, but you do need to say um, that you assign your rights in it. Then even if you're not, even if the person commissioning the work isn't an author, they still own the copyright, which is really what matters. So what does a copyright provide? Exclusive rights are, and a copyright owner or to reproduce the work. Again, an exclusive right, just like patents are exclusionary. Um, this is what a copyright owner can exclude others from doing. Reproducing the work, preparing derivative works, distributing copies, publicly performing the work, displaying it, transmitting it. Those are ex exclusive rights provided under copyright. And those rights may be licensed separately. Copyrights uh, typically last for, um, the author's life plus 70 years. If it's a work for hire, it could be 95 from publication or 120 from creation, whichever expires first. This is why if you can have something be a work for hire, it's beneficial. You've seen the copyright notice before. Um, it's important to use the copyright notice, which comprises the circle C, the year and the owner. If the notice is not used, no weight's given to a defense of innocent infringement to mitigate actual or statutory damages. So it's important to eliminate um, those defenses that you use the copyright notice. Again, registration is permissive, <clears throat> but you can't sue for infringement until copyrights registered. Pressing on, let's talk about trademarks. A different, a different animal. Um, trademarks or, excuse or any... me, 
I have, sure. we have a question in the chat. Sure. Can you please comment on universities owning IP of professors' work? How common is that? To which inventions does that apply? Does this apply to students or postdocs? Um, I think nowadays, most universities have their policies that provide those answers. I don't think there's a single unit, there's not a single answer to that. Depends on your university and your status, whether it's a professor or grad student or undergrad. I think universities have different policies on those things. Well, I can give you Reed's answer, um, yep. which is for CMU, mm -hmm. that what governs, there's a law, law called Bayh-Dole that requires the universities to manage intellectual property that is created if it's funded by our U.S. government or by contracts. So it's the source of funding that decides whether the university is responsible. We're not being greedy. <laughs> it's a law. So... Uh, but if you're a student, um, and even if you're a faculty or a postdoc that develops something that is not funded by uh, U.S. Uh, by you know one of our agencies or uh, uh, a contract, you can you own it. You can own it. There are a few universities. Um, I've seen some that will just say that if you're a student, regardless of the source of funding, uh, and you think of it while you're a student, that they, they have the potential right to own the intellectual property. But that practice is going away. Yeah, yeah. The pendulum is, is swinging. I think you're right. That, um, I think universities were more protectionistic of, of their uh, developments, and I think now they're getting more liberal in that, or at least um, they can kind of make the decision and um, I think universities have recognized that there's a lot of stuff being developed, but they don't have money to pursue them all, so they don't want to um, get in the way of people pursuing stuff that they've created. Um, and I think I think if you can sometimes attract uh, more talent if the talent thinks that they can keep the invention. And I think uh, someone has posted in the chat the link to the pit policy. Um, if people yeah. want to take a look at that. I haven't looked at it, I haven't compared them lately, but I'm, I doubt they're the identical. Let me, let me jog through trademark law for a moment and then we'll uh, turn it over to Loren. Um, just so you can say you've heard about these things. People so often confuse trademarks and copyrights. Trademarks are word, names, symbols, or devices that are used to identify the source of goods and distinguish the goods or services from those manufactured or sold by others. So it's a, it's a brand, it's your, it's your source identifier. It's really different from a copyright. Copyright protects works of, works of authorship. Trademarks protect source identifiers. So what are trademarks? They can be slogans or words or designs. They could even be, even be colors or sounds. Um, I didn't know um, previously that insulation didn't have to be pink. But Owens Corning has uh, chosen to add pink coloring to their insulation. And now we all know if you see pink insulation, it has to be Owens Corning's. What do trademarks do? They identify and distinguish the goods of the owner from competing goods. They guarantee a consistent level of quality. You know, when you go into a McDonald's in Beijing, you know what to expect. It's McDonald's. Uh, maybe a slight difference, but it's a McDonald's and, and you know that going in there. I think that's just a great example of what the trademarks uh, mean to us mentally. They represent the goodwill and reputation of a, of a company. You can acquire rights and trademarks through use. Once the mark is used, consumers begin to associate the mark with a specific product. This becomes a symbol of the company's reputation. This is called common law rights, unregistered rights. You have the rights as long as the use of the mark continues. However, again, there are benefits of federally registering your, registering your rights. It provides proof of nationwide protection, federal jurisdiction, certain procedural litigation advantages, and, and applications for trademarks aren't very costly, even though the trademarks may have quite, quite large value. Okay, so, so we have another question, George. Yeah. Is the name of a company or a product a trademark? Um, it can be. Let me give this example. Um, back to McDonald's, if I may. 
McDonald's um, can, can the, the term McDonald's can be a few different things. It can be the name of the company itself, which is a trade name, which isn't federally registrable per se as a trade name. But if you use the trade name as a trademark or service mark, it can be registrable. So you see McDonald's on the side of a restaurant, that is a service mark for restaurant services. When it's on the wrapper for a hamburger, it's a trademark for goods. So if you use your name as a trademark or service mark, it can be registered and protected as a service mark or trademark. You see KNL Gates here on the slide, that's our firm's name. Um, it's also our legal name, KNL Gates LLP is the official name. But KNL Gates is a service mark for our brand of legal services, which is registered. Uh, let's move on to the application process. Um, we'll kind of flip through this. It's examined kind of like a patent is. You can the examiner might reject it. You can argue with them. Um, so let's talk about very quickly some corporate issues here. Um, intellectual property assignments. Um, as I mentioned earlier, in my mind, if you're paying someone to do something, you should have a contract that says who's going to own it. Period. Um, you also want a contract that provides for confidentiality. Um, people, you'd just be amazed how often in business people are going around talking about things, trusting people with their secret information without an agreement. Certainly you should have confidentiality obligations and uh, limited use obligations. Well, I would just pipe on here too that what we tell all of our startups is you have to learn to talk about your innovation, your startup idea without talk, disclosing the secret sauce. So you can say having you know proprietary um, technology or advanced uh, algorithms or whatever you can say. You don't have to say, you can say it's maybe an algorithm uh, or a chemical compound, but you just don't say anything about how it's made or what's involved in it. Um, until the very, very end when they're getting ready to give you money. <laughs> it's subject so. to an agreement, right. Yeah. right. It's funny, people are, uh, inventors are very happy to talk about their inventions for free, but they don't want to write it down for the patent lawyers. So um, <laughs> it's just uh, kind of the way of life. Let me show you this slide. It's about rights and jointly developed IP. Here's some generalizations here, but uh, generally in the patent context, Co-inventors own equal and undivided interests in the patent. There's no duty to account to one another for royalties. Copyrights, uh, typically co-authors have independent rights with the duty to account. Trade secrets, less clear because a lot of this is uh, not statutory, but co-inventors can independently exploit and license trade secrets, probably without a duty to account depending on the jurisdiction. And trademarks, you really need the co-owners of trademarks to cooperate. Okay, I'm just going to also chime in here because on the first one, this comes up a lot in student teams who are working together on a capstone course. And there are five of you who are actually developing whatever it is. Uh, biomedical engineering comes to mind quite readily. Uh, one or two of the team decide that they want to then pursue this. They think it's got some commercial viability. Uh, one of the things you have to do, uh, hopefully you can talk to your fellow students to actually assign their rights over to you sometimes. Do you have to give them consideration? Some consider the class grade consideration, but do you have to give them money? But the point is, do that before they graduate and leave school, because then it's impossible to find them afterwards. That's great, I, great advice, Kid. and I'll just add this too. All of these ownership issues that we're talking about, you want to deal with them up front. Mm -hmm. Think about these things, provide for them up front, we always look at things as if this is going to become a, a billion dollar invention. And when they are, trust me, people fight about them. But if the documentation is clear up front, you're way ahead of the curve. Life, life is too short to be fighting about these things forever. So there's another question in chat. Um, one is um, the cost of getting trademarked, but it seems to me Loren does this in her presentation. Doesn't she go through that? I can, I can tell you, I think she'll a little, little more detail. 
typically to file a trademark application, we're looking at a little over $1,000 for file. Okay. That doesn't include searching, which is a good idea, but yeah. And then there was another question. Can you mention what happens if a trademark becomes associated with the whole range of products? Um, if the question is, does it become generic? The answer is it's not protectable. Uh, escalator uh, used to be a trademark and they didn't protect it. Aspirin used to be a trademark. They didn't protect it. And now mm. those marks have gone generic. Like Kleenex too, okay. Kleenex still does, but they're, they're on the, they're on the edge there. Xerox, uh, you, you might know, they, they've become very protecting. They had to become very protective of their brand. So just, just to kind of wrap up, what are some of the pri protection priorities? Um, in order, you should keep your invention secret. Think about trade secrets. Consider application filing. Um, not, not every case is it's the best thing to do, but consider that. Uh, if you're gonna file, do a robust disclosure, even a provisional. We think you should uh, brand products to the extent you can. There can be tremendous value in, in, in your brand. Um, and consider copyright protection, especially of software. So I will just, just kind of chime in here a little bit too. I hear um, sort of this false sense of wisdom going around that people were saying that um, investors want you to have patents. Having a patent just for a patent's sake, it, that is not necessarily true. And in some cases for software patents, investors realize that by the time you get the patent, you're probably the software you've applied for is obsolete. So it is, you need to really have a good strategy on that about whether it really provides value. Uh, the other thing I would say is that, um, just remember too, just because you have, if you file the provisional, and then you iterate on your invention as you go along and the design changes or some of those key features. Does that provisional uh, at the end of it protect what you have or do you have to file another provisional? You've got to, you've got to file, if, if the invention is iterating, you've got to file you know, the various iterations, but the key is to file the non-provisional within a year of the original, of the first one. Even if that's not exactly what you're ending up with? It, it's it, again. It always depends, but it, the <laughs> risk the risk is that if it, that someone could argue that uh, you did t disclose the kernel of what's ultimately going to be uh, claimed in that original provisional, um, so we we try and be very very careful and file within a year of their first provisional. Okay. And so lastly, just on the business sense too, just because you have a patent and somebody starts to infringe on it, you're a tiny little startup with not much money, so defending your IP um, and suing the other party or getting them to cease, just remember that can get expensive, so. It, it can, it can. That's why we, that's why frankly, we like to do a real good job up front um, so that people frankly respect our patents. And, um, and they know that if, uh, you know, they, 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 I said early on, you know, people that patents written for one of them is the, is a competition you want the competition to be afraid of your patent uh, and, and something we do a lot is we we file a series of continuation applications even when we get a patent we file a continuation application on another aspect of the invention to keep the competition guessing for, for many many years so with that let me um turn it over to the wren and uh thank you for your time thank you george all right. Um, I'll just need a moment. Let me try to share my screen. Oh, George has got. George, you've got to stop sharing yours. Okay. Okay. Let me do that. Good. Okay. It is in presentation mode for us. Okay. Great. So you can see my screen now, is that correct? Correct. Okay, great. So I am going to expand upon the groundwork that George laid and go into the patent um, procurement process or the process of filing and obtaining a US patent and a US trademark, and also some of the steps that you might take to conduct some preliminary searching. 
So this is what we're going to attempt to get through in the next 30 minutes. The, you know, the slideshow I know is available to all of you, so you can finish it up or go through some more of the details on your own time. And if you have questions, of course, happy to follow up and answer any of those. With the US patent process, the USPTO.gov website has phenomenal information and a lot of it is laid out for individuals and inventors. So I highly recommend also that you use USPTO.gov as a resource. This uh, list of eight steps for uh, obtaining a US patent, that is from the USPTO website. And we will go through, go through these steps in a little bit more detail. So in order to obtain your US patent, first you prepare the application. It includes a description, the drawings, and the claims that George was discussing. When, after you file your application, it's assigned to an examiner at the USPTO. And they will review your application and make sure it meets all of the formal requirements, look at the claims and make sure all the statutory requirements are met and conduct a prior art search. As the applicant, you're not required to conduct any, any searching. And if you, do, if you don't want to conduct patentability searches because of time or expense, then you don't, you're not required to. However, you are required to disclose the information that you're aware of to the patent office. We call those information disclosure statements. So if you're aware of prior art that is material to the patentability of your claims, you are obligated to disclose that, but not to conduct your own search. The examiner will search the prior art after they look at your claims and your application. And then this step, George discussed also in a little bit more detail, but there's of course back and forth with the patent office and hopefully ultimately the application issues as a patent. The process takes longer than most inventors originally expect. After we file the complete application, it, the average time, and this I just took this screenshot yesterday, so this is up to date. The average time before receiving the first office action is a little bit over 16 months. And then it's almost two years, the total pendency period of the applications. These are applications that are essentially one round of applications and not filing a request for continued um, examination after being finally rejected. So the pendency really can be three, four, five years, but this is the average for that first round. And they have been working to shorten the pendency time. You can see here back from 2013 until now, the total time has has, it's gotten to be a bit quicker. However, I know when you're the inventor, it still seems like a really long time to wait. There is an option to expedite the examination in certain situations, um, sometimes under certain programs or based on the inventor's age um, or by filing a fee for a track one application. So if you don't want to wait the average of 16 months to get the first office action, you have the opportunity to expedite it in certain instances. And now with respect to costs, this shows the timeline. I think it's helpful to see that not all of the costs are required upfront, but the initial costs, which is generally the largest variable is upfront. And that is the time, the inventor's time and the attorney's times in preparing the application. And George provided some, you know, it, it's going to depend on the complexity of the invention, maybe in the $8,000 range for a more simple invention, um, $14,000, $16,000 for a more complex application. And a simple, a simple application doesn't necessarily mean that the technology is simple or that it's not entitled to a patent. A lot of the greatest inventions are simple and can be described with just a few pages of description and just a few figures. Other times inventions require 100 sheets of drawings and 100 pages of description. So, so that's why the, there's a big, a big variable there and we really 
can't give a specific a specific amount without knowing the technology. After the application is prepared, we there are the filing fees. And all of these fees, there's three different numbers because if you are a small entity, um, then you qualify for a reduced fee. And if you're a micro entity, which most individuals would qualify as a micro entity or startups, then it's a further reduced fee. Um, so you can see just to file as a small entity, your initial fees would be $910. During the examination process, which starts about 16 months right after the filing date, that's where again, more attorney time and your time in responding to the office actions, amending the claims, reviewing the art that the examiner cites and formulating arguments to respond. And then after all that work and the back and forth with the patent office, if you ultimately receive a notice of allowance, the issue fee is due. As a small entity, the issue fee would be $600 and then your application issues as a US patent. And in the US, we have maintenance fees that are due at three different interval periods. And you can see they start off at three and a half years at $1,000 and they do increase over the life of the patent. So if your patent is in fact providing value to you and you wanna keep it in force, then you need to pay those, those fees too. So at three and a half years, seven and a half years and 11 and a half years. If you don't pay them, then your patent lapses and so anybody then can use your patent. Exactly, right. Okay. There are sometimes a few opportunities to um, pay the maintenance fees later, but you have to show that it was unintentional, that you didn't intend for your, your patent to lapse. So definitely advise to to stay on top of those deadlines if you do want to enforce enforce your patent rights. These are the different types of patent searching that you can conduct, and we'll go through these in a bit more detail. With respect to a patentability search, the goal of this search is to determine if an invention is in fact patentable, if it's, if it's new and non-obvious, and to help you define the scope of the claims. Because when you know what, what it exists in the prior art, then you're better able to define the meets and bounds of your invention in order to claim the invention as broadly as possible, but narrow enough to not, um, not be covered by the prior art. And so when conducting a patentability search, we are looking for anything in the entire world that is in the public domain. So this can be published documents, documents online, um, posters and presentations, videos, uh, YouTube videos are often, I've seen those cited even as prior art at the patent office. So anything that exists in the world that's in the public domain is, it qualifies as, as prior art. And we would be looking at all of that to determine if your invention is new and non-obvious over, over that prior art. Before I conduct a patentability search, I always ask the inventors to complete an invention disclosure form. And this is just some of the information that might be um, well, that would be relevant to preparing an application, but also to, to, to conducting a patentability search. And I think it's helpful. This is a helpful list to keep in mind if you think you have an invention in mind and you want to share that information with, not publicly, but with your attorney to help them prepare the application, then laying out the current state of the art and the problems with it, the solution that your invention um, prepares and going through what the various advantages are, different embodiments, different examples, some variations to perhaps your primary embodiment and fleshing all of those out in the invention disclosure form is incredibly helpful to the patent attorney or patent agent that's preparing your application and also for conducting a patentability search. And then with this information in mind, it's easier to 
how to develop the keywords in the search strategy in order to search for the, the, the prior art. Another type of search is a validity search. And this, the goal of this search is to determine the validity of an issued patent. In this case, there is a patent in hand in, as opposed to just an invention disclosure form or an idea. And so you look at the scope of the invention that's in the claims and you conduct a search to find prior art before the filing date of that patent. So I have here just an example because I think it's helpful to understand those dates a little bit more. So again, for, for a validity search, you would be looking to find the invention that's as is defined in the claims, not in the entire specification, but the scope of the invention as it's claimed and to see if it was disclosed or in the public domain before the filing date of the application. In this, the case of this application, you can see that there is a provisional application that was filed originally. So the date, the critical date that we'd be searching for is this September 25th, 2015 date and to see what prior art existed before that date. So I just bring that up because it's not necessarily the date the application was filed, which was in 2016, but in fact, the provisional filing date. And other times the application will go back to a foreign filing. So all of that information is on the front page of the patent. Another type of prior art searching is an infringement search. The goal of an infringement search is to determine whether a patent claim would be infringed. And so you're comparing a proposed product or service, perhaps it's as a startup, it's, it's uh, a product or a service that you plan to practice and develop and you want to ensure that you are not infringing any other people's patent rights. So in that case, you need to make sure that the patents that you're looking at are in fact still in force. So it's for this case, we know that patents generally have a 20 year term from the filing date. In this case, this application was filed September 23rd, 2016. And it's 20 years from that filing date, not 20 years from the provisional application filing date, but from the the non-provisional filing date. And if in fact the application is still in force and you are infringing the claims of that patent, then you, that's something that you need to be cautious about. You can also check on the USPTO Gov website whether the maintenance fees have been paid or if the application has lapsed. However, always be aware that some of those lapped, apps, lapped applications, as I mentioned before, um, perhaps a maintenance fee was just missed inadvertently or accidentally, accidentally, and by filing a petition, then you can submit a late payment, um, and it will it will be reinstated. Clearance searches are a way to determine if practicing a particular um, a particular invention is a safe practice meaning that there's a reduced risk of patent liability because that invention had been dedicated to the public. So in this case, you are looking for expired patents where the term has, has expired, the 20 year term, or patents that have lapsed because the maintenance fees weren't paid and, and are past the point where they can be reinstated and also abandoned published patent applications. A final, general type of search is a state-of-the-art search. We conduct these occasionally just to get a lay of the land in a technical space. Oftentimes if a startup is thinking of going in a certain direction and wants to know who the other big players are in that field and, and if, there's, if there's space for them to, to grow and develop their idea, then you might conduct a, a state-of-the-art search. Now, the USPTO.gov website has a great, a great layout and a great search um, strategy for conducting patentability searches. So again, that's the type of search where you have 
you are an inventor and you're thinking about filing a patent application, we'd like to know if your invention is new and non-obvious. So it's a way of searching the existing published US patents and issued published US patent applications and issued US patents, which comprise a large part of the prior art. Though of course we know that prior art includes a lot more than that too and isn't limited to just patents and patent applications. But these are the seven steps and we will go through this example briefly. I do recommend if you want to search for your own, if you want to conduct your own searches on your own inventions, that you use, you go through this exercise first with a simple technology that's easy to understand to get familiar with the USPTO website. And then it will be easier for you to adapt that for your particular invention. The step Step one for a patentability search is to brainstorm your key terms. So in this example, our invention is a novel umbrella with a new rib design to eliminate collapsing or inverting due to winds. And so as, initial, as an initial step, we would brainstorm our key terms, which I've listed a few here. And this is a lot easier to do if you've already filled out your invention disclosure form and you've thought through the problems with the prior art and the solution that your invention provides. And with these key terms, you can think about if some of these are terms in the art um, or perhaps they are, you can come up with synonyms or other ways to describe the words, then that can also be very helpful. Okay, step two is to find the CPC scheme. So if you go to the USPTOGov.website, website, um, you can search in that search box for CPC scheme umbrella, which is your your keyword, and it will take you to a list of matches and then you can find the best match. You can see they ha actually have a classification that is devices for increasing the resistance of umbrellas to wind. So very specific and wouldn't it be great if we could see all the patent applications and issued patents that are in that class. And in fact, you can, which is, is, is very, very helpful. So then you search you pull up that CPC and you can open it up and review what the definition of it and look at some examples. So the examples in this case are various images that show umbrellas with different features that make them more resilient. Step five is then to retrieve the US patents with that that are assigned into that class. And so if you search for patents you'll be clicking on the button PAT FT, which is the full text patents. And you can type in your scheme, press search, and it will provide you with a full list. The last time I conducted the search, I think there were about 120 different patents that were in this class. This is one of them. And it shows, again, pulling up the front page, you can look at the inventors, the assignee, or the company who owns who owns the patent. You can also see the list of references cited on the front page of the patent. The reason that I bring that information to your attention is because when you are going through this process, if you find a patent that's particularly relevant or on point to what you're doing, then you might want to search to see if that, those inventors are named as inventors on other patent applications. And you can also search by inventor name on the USPTO website. You can search by assignee name. So you could look for other patents that are assigned to the same companies. And the references cited, those are the references that the applicant, the inventor in this case, thought were material to patentability or that the examiner, the asterisk ones are the ones the examiner cited and thought were material to patentability. 
So for those references that you find that are close and relevant, then I recommend you go through the next step and, and you can look at the references that were cited in that, if the inventors have other, have other um, applications and also search by ASINI. Now for steps five and six, you step five is the step I just talked about, looking at the references that were cited. Steps Arne, can I interrupt you with a question on that? Of course. So uh, CMU files the patents when um, you know, we're obligated to do so. And it would show that CMU is the owner of that patent or are we showing the inventors? So how? how on the front page, it, it will show the inventors, but if an assignment has been filed and recorded with the patent office, so then it will be, it will list, it will list an assassin, an assignee as CMU. But I think oftentimes with the case of universities, if, and again, it depends on who funds it, I know at CMU, but if CMU files the application, they will also be listed as the applicant. And you can search by applicant name as well. And then if one of our startups licenses that IP into their startup company, like the inventor's gonna start a company and they're gonna license that IP that CMU has filed the patent for, then it would show that company or the founders? It will license, it won't show if the technology has been licensed to anyone. Only if the patent itself, the ownership of it has changed from if CMU owned it initially and then assigned it to the company, the startup. Oftentimes, when the, the, the co-inventors are the original owners of the, of the patent, and, but they can assign it to, to the startup, and oftentimes there's an obligation for employees to assign it to their company. So then that would show the assignee. So it does get a little confusing because there's these three categories, but there's the three categories because in different situations, the inventors and the applicant might be the same or the assignee and the applicants might be the same. Okay. It would depend on, on the facts. Okay, thank you. And generally, but I, by searching the inventors and assignee, you get the closest prior art because there can be a lot of applicants an applicant might file a lot of um, applications, but maybe it, they're not all related. Let me throw in, Loren, um, license agreements can be recorded, but they're almost never recorded because people want to keep them secret. But they can be made of record if you like. Mm. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yes, I'm sorry, I was muted. Let's see. Step seven is broaden your search and I provided a few different ways that you could do that earlier by searching for the assignee or the applicant or by the inventor's last name. You can also conduct keyword searching by coming up with different Boolean strings and looking for different combinations. You know, this can sort of open Pandora's box and you just have thousands of hits. That's not very helpful, but if you can tweak your search string in order to narrow it down by using some combinations of synonyms and then ands between, between, between different features, you can usually get a reasonable number of hits to go through. Let's see. So moving on, I think that let me just double check. Right, that's the last the last slide about trademarks. Moving on to patents, we've already discussed or trademarks. This we've already discussed the different types of trademarks, and they can be sounds, they can be colors, they can be shapes, they can be scent, like in the case of Plato. There's all different types of trademarks. There's trade dress, something like this, where of course you know what store it is, though it doesn't say the name of the store in this image. And here is the, the application 
or the registration rather for that. The trademark procurement process also has a great layout on the USPTO.gov website. You can see the six steps there in order to go from TM, which means you are using the mark as a trademark to the circle R, meaning it has been registered. Here is a flow chart which shows the process. So with trademarks, you can file a trademark application as uh, intent to use if you haven't started using it yet in commerce, then you would follow the 1A basis, but upon completion of that, when you get the notice of allowance, you have to file a statement of use and prove that you have started using it. And you can request an extension of time in that case. I think it's up to three years with in six month increments of requesting an extension of time to establish use. But eventually, because trademarks are, are based on using the mark in commerce, you have to start using it. How much will, will obtaining a trademark cost? So the current filing fees are $750 per class, $350 if you are filing it electronically. And a class is, the, the US lays out, the US PTO lays out the different classes. It's going to, oftentimes we just file in one class, but sometimes you might be using it for a product and a service that would be two classes or multiple products that fall in different classes. So there are times where you do pay the fee multiple times in order to cover multiple classes. And again, the same with the same with patents, there are maintenance fees that are due, though these are not as hefty as the patent maintenance fees. Every 10 years, for example, there's a $425 fee to maintain your trademark. That's also accompanied by a statement and proof that you are still using it in commerce. To conduct trademark searching, if you go to the USPTO.gov website and click on the trademark search, you'll be able to search for an exact mark that you might be thinking of using with a startup, or you can also search for parts of that mark. I usually recommend also using sounds like searching, so it might be a different spelling, but it sounds the same. And you can combine parts of the mark with the classification, the class, to see if something's being used in entirely different class for entirely different goods or services, um, it's probably not problematic for you to start using it. Though, of course, it will depend on the mark and definitely would recommend having a, a trademark attorney look at that and, and consider whether or not it's too close to use. This is a way of searching for registered or registered trademarks. Some have some that are active, others that are inactive, but also it's important with trademarks to search common law use and using Google or Bing or whatever search engine you prefer to use to see if your mark is used there. So I know it is 6.30 and that I'm out of time, <laughs> but I just, I'll maybe two or three minutes, I'll just flip through the rest of these slides. And then if you wanna revisit them on your own time and go into more detail, I'm happy to answer questions later. And my contact information is at the end of the presentation. So this just, this, this image just shows that there's a lot of different types of intellectual property and a lot of different ways that you can protect your your intellectual property and that you should protect your intellectual property in a lot of circumstances. So really just think about what you're doing and how valuable it is and, and the best way to protect it because all of these different forms have different terms, they protect different features, they, um, they, they might all be relevant or maybe one or two are and it's important to think about all of them. Well, this first case study just shows, and you can, again, look at it more on your own time, but this is a CMU grad that we were fortunate enough to work with to protect some of his IP. And you can see 
some of the robots that he developed on this slide. And he has filed um, both utility patents, design patents, trademarks, and copyrights to protect the different, different aspects of his products and services. Here is a registered US trademark. There were also some foreign trademarks that were registered. This is one of his robots. I think I can keep talking over the music and maybe you'll be able to hear me. Yes? Yeah. Okay. Um, so this particular robot was called Blenny and we filed provisional applications directed to this technology followed up with utility patents. We filed a design applicate a design patent application and obtained a design patent. I think in this case there were also opportunities. You can see perhaps the name Blenny could have been trademarked. Um, copyrights to the the um, what we would call like the sculptural aspect of it, and even trade dress. So that's Blenny. He's a super great robot. This was the issued US utility patent. You can see the claims. This is the design patent on the same product. And it shows that in this case, we were going after not the functions, but actually how the robot looked. And what's interesting to note about design patents, you can see in figures 11 and 12, for example, the arms are shown with dashed lines. So we're not in this case claiming the shape of the arms as part of the design, just the circular body and the googly eyes looking around. This was another robot that we worked on that touch, touch sensitive robot for kids to learn emotions. Again, utility patents, design patents, um, Another another robot that has a metronome. This one we filed copyright registrations on to protect um, the sculpture and also one directed to the drawings. And this is our the design application on the same. So it's just interesting to see how one product, but there's multiple different ways to to protect that product. So this is another case study. I'll let you go through it on your own time. Thank you so much for sticking with me. Hopefully, um, I can't see if anybody's still on the call because I'm on full screen with my- uh, I only lost one, I only lost one. Oh, okay, one, so. great. Well, that's good. Well, thank yeah. you. Yeah, so Lauren, thank you. That was absolutely excellent. Uh, I did put this in chat, but I will just repeat it. Um, this pre both presentations are available on the Pitts um, Big Idea Center website, uh, as well as this was recorded. And secondly, it's also available on the Short Center website under Workshop Archives. And there's also, if you scroll down there, you can also see the presentation. And Tiffany, if you're still around, uh, do you send this out to everybody uh, who participated? Yes, um, so they'll receive the video recording as well as both of the slideshows. Okay, so because that, that was just excellent, excellent. Um, so hopefully you <laughs> understand a lot about the patenting and obviously the kind of the deep expertise that is needed in order to make sure you get a good one um, and that you continue your patent strategy because sometimes one is not enough. So. Anyway, so um, on that, if there's anybody wants to ask a question, um, if not, then both George and Lorenz contact information is available on both of their slide decks.